My name is Sally Thorne, as I know most of you in the room, and I have the privilege of moderating this session. And we have today three wonderful people who know a lot about <coughs> cancer survivorship. And the star of the show is Ray Chan, who is here from, from Brisbane and uh, has spent last week, Nurses Week, um, getting everybody excited at BC Cancer. And I, I know the reports that we heard from all of our nursing colleagues there was that it was just a fabulously exciting week and lots and lots of uh, connections, collaborations, ideas, stimulation, and we're just really glad to be able to have him here today. And he's going to lead us off with some presentation of some of the, th the ideas that are on his mind. Um, we're then going to hear from Fuchsia Howard, who's here on faculty in the School of Nursing, and then from Christina Morrison, who is first. Oh, you got stuck, got stuck behind Emily. Christina Morrison, who's here, um, nurse practitioner from the BC Cancer Agency with a portfolio in survivorship. So we're just really thrilled to have all you, all of you here. Um, Ray will talk for approximately 20 minutes, the other two for 10 minutes, um, and then we'll we'll hear from them, and then we'll just create a free-for-all open discussion. So um, I'm guessing if you have a burning question, feel free to ask it, but otherwise we'll we'll hear from people and then... Um, open it all up. We'd schedule this from 12 to 1.30. I suspect that there may be some people that come and some have to go. Um, that's fine. And then we'd schedule a lunch from 1.30 to 2, but that means just stay around and continue talking if you're able. So without further ado, I want to introduce Ray Chan. So, oh, um, I'm sorry I still got a BC Cancer Agency. I should call it UBC, okay. but... <laughs> But um, I guess you guys are so integrated. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for having me again um, here today. I'm very, very privileged um, to be here at UBC um, speaking to you about a topic that I am very, very passionate about. And I know that, it's very, I know that many of you are um, as well. It's, it's really around um, cancer survivorship research and uh, what now and where to next. Um, I presented already, I think, three or four talks at uh, BC Agency last week. Um, and there were a lot of data in some of those slides. And indeed, indeed one of the slides um, was 15, 15 megabytes <laughs> because I had a lot of pictures and a lot of data in it. Um, but I thought what I would do over the coming 10 to 15 minutes is just to share with you my thought about how we can really rethink about where to next, um, considering what um, what we already know. So a little bit of background um, to those of you who are non-Australian. Um, I'm from this town called Brisbane, um, and that's really in Queensland, and this is my university um, here in Brisbane in QUT. Um, and if you're visiting us, um, it's very, very close to Cairns um, and Gold Coast, and you get beautiful beaches and beautiful um, coral sea um, in Queensland. So please do come and visit us, and when you do come around, um, do let us know that you're around. Um, a little bit of background of my current role. I am in a chair, um, chair role between a hospital and a university uh, as the professor of cancer nursing. Um, our uh, hospital has 700 beds, 2,400 nurses. It's not only cancer. It's a general hospital, but cancer is one of the specialties. And we have around 250 nurses um, in, cancer, in cancer services. Um, we, we are a magnet hospital, and in that way, I was just telling Sally that I feel so lucky um, to be working with some of the uh, clinicians who are very, very um, interested in research and translating research into practice. Um, uh, I also co-chair a collaborative um, that we call the Queensland Collaborative for Cancer Survivorship. So today, although what we're going to talk about is really the nurse-led initiative, but um, everything, everything that we do are uh, interprofessional. So we have got psychiatrists on our team, health economists, um, statistician, medical oncologist, hematologist. One very, very special point about our about our program of research is that we have got executives uh, who are very, very interested in cancer survivorship. And indeed, my co-chair, um, he's he's a medical oncologist, but he's also the director for medical oncology. So we have people who are telling us that uh, when we go around the room before we started this collaborative, we, we ask people, what is in it for you? Uh, what makes you want to join this collaborative? And the executives told us that 
the only thing um, that is the most important to us is model of care change. If your research can drive model of care change, I'm on it. I'm in it and I will actually support it. So um, so this is our website that you'll be welcome to uh, to look at in terms of some of our latest research in our, in our uh, uh, publications as well. Um, I had a few slides um, in my talk when I was a BC agency and when I begin to look at how similar or how different we are and Tracy and I actually met each other a few years ago now, five years maybe, I don't know, um, but Kennel, Kennel, which is the cancer nursing organization in Canada, is very, very, very similar to CNSA, which is the organization that I have been a president for over the past few years. And Tracy was the president for Kennel at around the same time. So um, that was one very, very similar point. But when I look at the um, population, which is, you know, just to give you a little bit of context, is that when you look at the number of survivors that we have in Canada and Australia, we have roughly the same number of cancer survivors. We have got just over a million of cancer survivors in terms of people living with, can with a cancer diagnosis who is, um, um, you know, uh, alive um, in Australia. You do have a bigger population than we do in terms of the whole nation, but how weird when I actually started looking at your province and my state, it is very, very similar population. And when I begin to look at your city and our city, it is so similar. Um, but what is what I thought um, uh, is really giving me a sense of urgency or to give me the fuel to really continue my efforts, my research efforts in this area, is really to, to have a sense of urgency. Um, in cancer survivorship, and by by 2040, which is 20 years um, 20 years uh, later, we are expecting that we will have 1.9 million cancer survivors um, in Australia, and I'm expecting that it will probably be, be similar to you. I don't know um, the true number, but it is this is only an estimation. But essentially, it's nearly double of the numbers that we have um, uh, right now. So I thought. When, what now, and where to next? And you know, and I don't think that I'm gonna be sharing a lot of data per se, but but just um, have a reflection on what are the responsive stuff that we have been doing in nursing or cancer nursing in the space of cancer survivorship, but also where to next? What can we be really proactive um, about? Which is really the proactive, uh, the proactive piece. And I'm just about to ask you to make some decisions here when you reflect some of the key challenges that we have in cancer survivorship. And you tell me whether you think that as a profession in nursing, uh, whether we have been on a front foot, whether we have been very proactive, or whether you think that, yeah, we're doing a pretty good job in responding to the needs of cancer survivors, or whether you think that we're actually quite reactive. Um, to all these challenges. So, um, so with technology, how many of you think that we are quite proactive? Responsive? Reactive? And, and just to give you an example, I was just, we have recently, maybe th three years ago, we got fully digital in our hospital that gone totally paperless. And, um, we were so reactive. We didn't have a program to teach nurses uh, or to prepare nurses to be uh, to be a competent, capable nurse providing care in a fully digital hospital. So we actually had to wait until we become fully digital, and then we learn all those stuff that we are learning now about our human communication, and you know, with all these AIs, a, um, uh, AI thing that is sort of coming to healthcare. How are we going to really prepare ourselves for that? Um, we have got an institute uh, from our, at our university of biofabrication, and of course, they will just keep planning without nursing. Um, and when they actually start thinking about patient consent, and interestingly, they did this qualitative study looking at um, what is really required in patient consent. And I was the poster judge, so I was going around. So I asked them, what who did you actually really include in the qualitative interviews? And they told me, well, we included the physicians and the surgeons. And I was like, wrong answer. <laughs> no nurses, no patients. 
And I said that nurses are the experts of patient experiences, and you can't have an institute of biofabrication and look, looking into all this human aspect of care without the involvement of nurses and patients. Precision health, and you know, one big topic is genomics. How many of you think that as a profession we are quite proactive in that? Responsive? Reactive? Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Yeah, 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 that's great, that's great. The increase in cancer population, how many of you think they would be quite proactive? Responsive? Yeah, 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 reactive? Yeah, a little bit. Um, the constant changing environment, as it is so interesting for us, you know, all these universities are looking into, you know, the new generations of nurses that we are, that we are producing, but you know, that it's sort of coming into the workforce and the, the different expectations that they carry with them as they enter into the workforce. How many of you think that we're quite proactive in that? Yeah, responsive? Yeah, and reactive? Okay. Um, okay, what about the evolving um, anti-cancer treatment? Proactive? Responsive? Reactive? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's quite um, quite a mixed response that we have, but um, I, and I do ask you to later on as we actually go to talk a little bit more about what we're doing now. I do ask you to sort of put the lens um, in front of you when you look at all these things, all these challenges that we actually see in terms of how we can actually be more proactive um, in them. Um, how many of you here know of this framework? Um, this framework is from your country. <laughs> that is the Pan Pacific. Uh, sorry, the Pan Pacific, the Pan Canadian um, framework for cancer survivorship research. And I love this diagram. Um, and I really, really think that we need to say say it loud and clear. And it's not just not just just in Vancouver or Canada, but internationally in Australia, we need to tell people that nurses nurses has such a key role. To play, and actually, at one of my talks at BC Agency, I was just telling, um, telling the the nurses that the fact that we are doing a whole whole lot of um, of research with GP in terms of how we engage family physicians in the care of cancer, cancer survivors, um, the government, Cancer Australia, which is the only cancer agency um, that does national work, and they actually developed this shared care plan with GPs without involvement of a single nurse and I just I was so 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 angry <laughs> but we need to claim the space and we need to be better at selling our contribution as well because I do believe that we are we are experts of patient experiences so just in my humble opinion I just sort of circle the things that I thought that nurses would be best placed to lead um, to lead some of these initiatives. And yes, they need to be interprofessional, and yes, they need to be consumer-centered, but I do believe that they need to be nurse-led, um, and we need to say to people loud and clear. I do think that we need to have, in terms of how we can actually be more proactive, I do think that we need to be more proactive in focusing on precision nursing interventions. And, um, and I was sharing with some of you that I just spent a week with um, Christy Mauskowski in San Francisco learning about genomics uh, and the implication of that in nursing. Because I say that I don't want to become a geneticist, and that's not what I'm here for, but I want to learn about genomics and the implication of that in our care, um, which is really not just about informing the best anti-cancer drug for the patient, but how do we know enough about the patients for us to actually tailor our, our nursing interventions for our patients, people who are waiting in a waiting room, if we know that some people are consistently going to have worse outcomes versus people who have got moderate and good outcomes, how are we really going to begin to triage uh, patients and actually tailor and actually allocate our resources properly and there are already quite a number of studies and indeed um, I'm doing a study with um, with Christine at the moment looking at um, genomics and uh, in terms of gene expression and cognition uh, connective dysfunction in cancer patients so how do we actually know which patients are more likely going to 
do worse. And so we make sure that people like Christina know them upfront early to actually allocate more resources to them at a later stage. So, and I think we talk about this so much, and I'm so fascinated to find out that your School of Nursing is located together with the engineers mm -hmm. uh, and people from other disciplines, and that is the best place to be, because in, in my university it's not, it's together with all the other health sciences. So, um, I, I think that myself, uh, speaking, I can only speak for myself instead of the entire profession, although I do think that our profession can be more proactive. I think that I've been very complacent in terms of working with people who are from other fields. And when we actually begin to tackle a problem, um, how often do we really get to really sit down with the lawyers and the entrepreneurs and, you know, what have you, to really, really solve a problem? Um, and I was just really beginning to to challenge my thinking that, you know, is it really incremental sciences that we need in terms of engaging the GP? How would Uber actually begin to start solving this problem if they are actually in the room? Um, so I do think that there needs to be a lot more interprofessional, interdisciplinary thinking and research. Um, I've got a very, very nice picture here of, of Sally and, and, uh, and Tracy, but I do believe that with all these things that we want to do, we need to continue to build generations of nurse scientists who can be leaders. And I've got little points there, which is really around the volume. We need so many more of them, but we also need so many more of them who are embedded um, in the clinical setting. And I was just sharing with Sally that we are very fortunate in Australia to be seeing more chair positions um, of our professors embedded in the clinical setting. Um, and these are the professors of cancer nursing across Australia. Um, and as I sort of look at all of us, uh, one, two, three, four, four of us actually have chair positions, meaning that we spend the majority of our work time in the hospital rather than the university. So for myself, I spend 90% of my time in the hospital and 10% in the university. Um, so I do think that we need to, um, to have generations of scientists and you're already doing a lot of it and we are really hoping that um, into the future there could be more um, clinical buy-in from the hospitals. So what might a proactive approach look like? Um, and I'm just sharing um, a couple of studies um, here because I want to focus more time on our panel discussion. We did a, a single center study asking the nurses what survivorship interventions they believe fall within their remit as a nurse, as a cancer nurse in an acute cancer center. What we found is that yes, the majority of them, we actually got these interventions from in terms of content, uh, we actually got them from the IOM report, um, loss in translation. But um, and when we actually asked them whether they believe that it should be part of their role as an acute cancer care nurse to be delivering these survivorship interventions, most of them say yes. You know, we've got 50, over fifty percent right. But we also have a number of things here which could be a gap in terms of nurses. And when we ask them how confident they are and also how often they do deliver the care, it's actually not that many of them who feel comfortable delivering those care, like uh, discussing about fertility, discussing about you know their finances, linking people up with GP, in this, which is the whole transition piece uh, back to the community. So. So once again, you know, I, I think I do have to challenge myself, you know, how do we resolve that? Um, and, and we do have an intervention that we are actually currently testing. When we ask people about what are the major barriers that impede their quality survivorship care uh, interventions, and they, of course, right, you know, the top thing is lack of time, lack of skills, no dedicated time for that, uh, physical location, everything is so packed, um, educational resources. And I just began to sort of look at this list and I thought, you know, how would Uber, you know, actually solve this problem? And maybe, really, if we actually really think um, hard enough with our interprofessional colleagues, they might actually be able to challenge us to think out of the box. Uh, because whenever I thought about lack of time, there must be, there must be something that we can do to convince the nurses to not ever say that again. But... But, but that's not the solution. 
that is probably not the solution. You know, if 20 years ago, when you ask people why they don't want to do research in the literature, why they don't engage in evidence-based practice, lack of time. And I don't think 20 years later, they're going to tell us anything different. But how can we use technology to free them up from certain tasks, for example, how do we actually begin to um, deliver deliver education? You know, and, and of course, in the higher education sector, we keep thinking, right? How do we how do we bring education to people that they don't have to come to class and have that experience, right? You know, we ask ourselves those sort of questions all the time. But, but what can we really be um, proactive about? Um, we did this survey with uh, 1,873 cancer survivors in the Asia Pacific region, asking them about their symptoms. And these, um, this study is quite different in that it's taking a population approach whereby we are asking people who have already finished treatment, and many of these people are actually living years beyond their uh, cancer, uh, cancer treatment completion. And when you go to the waiting room, people who come back for follow-up, these are the symptoms that they are experiencing. So it's many of these people are five years beyond treatment when you look at the median uh, time since diagnosis. Um, how do we begin to solve these problems? How do we make sure that we can know upfront that these people are going to still suffer these symptoms years uh, down the track? And um, we are actually doing a number of intervention studies uh, looking at these symptoms still in the context of cancer survivorship. And I showed this slide to some of my colleagues uh, in BC Agency. These are some of the unmet care needs. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, when, whenever we talk about, and, and parking is not here, but certainly parking comes up, right, you know, in many, many, in a lot of the literature as an unmet care need. Um, and I don't remember whether this particular tool that they use, um, capture parking, but but some other tools of unmet needs does. And um, when I watched this news recently that was just talking about how you can shift a car from one place to another place through an underground system, and I was just thinking, oh my God, you know, this technology is really coming. You know, what can be the out of the box thing that we can really think about? Because the executives in my hospital told me that don't look at parking ray because we will never ever solve the problem. And I think that we are sometimes quite limited um, uh, by our own thinking. I do think, you know, cancer recurrence, fear of cancer recurrence, how do we actually resolve that? This is the model of cancer survivorship in Australia. Um, and many parts of this model is actually quite aspirational, you know, so we have the diagnosis, um, treatment, um, uh, you know, or end of treatment for many people who do probably have a single time point whereby we can identify as the primary um, and a primary treatment. Um, how do we risk stratify people? Because many people talk about risk stratification, but the evidence base for it is not strong in terms of how we can predict um, people's response to intervention. Uh, who are the people who actually need um, the most care? And based on that, we actually allocate people to different levels of, um, of resources and really need to be an integrated care uh, system. This is um, uh, the engaged intervention, which is an intervention that we are testing at the moment, that we have the nurse as the conduit between the acute cancer centre transitioning people back to the GP. In the past, what we did in our research was that we will fax the survivorship care plan to the GP and expect that they would actually do what we told them to do. But now we are taking that one step further to have the nurse to dial in the GP to a video conferencing with the patient. And we actually decide on what the GP is happy to do, what they are not happy to do, and then we allocate our resources in the acute cancer center um, uh, more efficiently. Uh, even then, you know, I thought that this is quite novel because we're using video conferencing, but then I thought more about it. People are already doing telehealth you know, <laughs> 10 years ago. This is not that novel. So, but we don't have the evidence. So I just begin to think about, yes, you know, mostly I'm going to call this incremental advances, but you know, what is going to be groundbreaking? What is going to be the out of the box thinking? And I hope that we can talk a little bit more about it later on. So I think, I do think that we need to think a little bit about what we need to do to be responsive or more responsive or more proactive for. So I'm just going to stop here. Um,
by sharing a couple of slides with you uh, in terms of take home messages in my humble opinion is that I think nursing needs to take ownership of cancer survivorship. I think we need to focus, have a greater focus on precision nursing interventions. Uh, we need to lead interdisciplinary thinking if we continue to pride ourselves as um, the expert of patient experiences. We need to build, continue to build generations of nurse scientists as leaders. Um, and I think take home questions, and I hope that we can get to talk to some of these things later on, is uh, have we been complacent in anything? You know, while we're celebrating all the advances of our cancer care giants um, in our cancer care community, you know, like people like Sally, you know, and, and many of you here, uh, what have we done well, but also what have we been quite complacent on? And I, I personally say that, you know, in terms of technology, I, I still think that we are quite complacent. Um, what does nursing need to do to be responsive and proactive? And what is the role of nurse scientists and what is our role? So I'll stop here. Next up, Fuchsia Howard. So before I begin, thank you so much, Ray, for um, setting the stage. And it's wonderful to see the uh, parallels with Australia, between uh, Canada and Australia. It's really quite exciting, I think, when we think about partnerships for move moving cancer survivorship research forward. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Tracy Truant and Sally for organizing this event, because, you know, uh, cancer survivorship research is very much multidisciplinary. And it's rare that we actually take the time to reflect on nursing's role in cancer survivorship. So I think it's a really nice time to sort of take a minute and reflect and think about where we can move to next. So in thinking about this talk, I was uh, wondering, well, where have we come from? So I did a little bit of digging, and this is one of the oldest articles that I could find. And this was written uh, by Dr. Karen Tamlin Lehman, who's from New, uh, University of New Brunswick. And it was published in 1995, so over 20 years ago. And what she suggested that the main issues and challenges facing cancer survivorship research was really around a lack of evidence in all areas. Specifically, though, in what are those long-term late effects that people experience uh, far from treatment? Second, what are the models of care? So there was a recognition that the acute care model of care would not actually translate and serve survivors well past treatment. There was also recognition, and she says that there was no information about uh, how we may uh, meet the needs of survivors and what interventions might actually work. She also suggested that one of the main challenges was actually that survivorship is not a priority. And I think we've come a long way, but I think we still have a ways to go. And that is with providers themselves. So it's interesting where you say that uh, cancer nurses themselves don't necessarily see that it's part of their role. Well, that was over 20 years, and they're still saying the same thing today. But also the lack of commitment from healthcare organizations and funding bodies, because we, as we all know, Treatment is the priority. It was then, and it continues to be now. So I'm glad that Ray went over this framework <laughs> for me. But what's really exciting about this is this was published last year, and um, it really is a pan-Canadian framework for how we can think about survivorship care. And although it's not specific to nursing, what it does is it provides nursing uh, a context with which to situate our research. And what they went, to, went on to do is to identify different domains of research as well as some cross-cutting themes. And rather than go into these in detail, what I'd like to do today is just provide a couple of what I think are amazing examples of the of the research that Canadian nurses have done. So I'm focusing more on the Canadian perspective and what nurses have contributed. And what I'm going to suggest is that nurses, as Ray said, have really led, uh, led the research when it comes to survivors' experiences. They've also made a tremendous contribution in Canada around models of care. And also, uh, specifically our uh, organizations like CANO and CAPO, have I really tried to address this knowledge to practice gap. And one cross-cutting theme 
that nurses have also done a wonderful job in Canada is in the area of intervention research. So what I'm going to do next is just go through and provide a couple of examples <coughs> of where I see uh, nurse researchers really leading the way. So just to start us off, individual researchers in Canada have done tremendous work in describing the diversity of experiences and outcomes of a variety of different cancer populations. And those experiences have very much revolved around the physical symptoms that survivors experience, but also psychosocial challenges. And this extends beyond distress to considering things like work, financial problems, sexual issues, and there's been some really interesting work by Karen Olson out of U of A. She's developed a framework around cancer-related fatigue. Dr. Ann Katz in Manitoba has, been a, has um, really led research around sexual changes. We've also, in Canada, done a great job in looking at and describing uh, individual survivors' experiences of coping and self-management. An example of that is Dr. Krista Wilkins, who's a new investigator from out east. And she did a great uh, series of, of investigations where she looked at how survivors themselves live with, but also manage the risk for developing secondary cancers. So some very in-depth knowledge about the experiences. And of course, the work that Sally's done in, in cancer communication is a great example of how survivors themselves experience healthcare providers in the healthcare system. So the individual researchers have done a great job, but what has also been really great in Canada is that nurses have been in leadership roles, particularly at CPAP. And we have uh, Dr. Mark Fitch and Esther Green to thank for ensuring that survivor perspectives are considered to be uh, evidence that's foundational to developing patient-centered care. So there's been this study that's just started, the preliminary results were released, I think, in January. And it's a really great study. It's a survey study, but provides some very uh, broad res uh, research findings. It was a survey of 13,000 survivors, one to three years post-treatment. And what's interesting is that as nurses, we actually probably aren't very surprised by the findings of this research. So a large majority of survivors have difficulties, difficult times after treatment. 80% have physical challenges. 70% have emotional challenges. And 40% practical challenges. I mean, those numbers are out, they're remarkable, really. But nurses, if you look to the literature, have very much described in depth what these issues are and how they may evolve over, over people's lifetimes. So that sort of brings us to the next point around models of care. Nurses have been the leaders in designing and testing innovative uh, interventions. And these interventions have include things like self-management interventions. There's been great work, Dr. Doris Howell out of U of T has looked at nurse-led behavioral self-management interventions, specifically about reducing symptom distress. Uh, Dr. Sylvie Lambert, who's a new investigator out of McGill, she's looked at developing home-based, web-based exercise programs for prostate cancer survivors. So some very interesting and innovative approaches to those issues we see that people are struggling with. There's been uh, some research in the area of survivorship care plans. I think we're starting to make some inroads, but there's a huge uh, there's a huge way to come in terms of survivorship care plans. All agencies, all places are supposed to be doing them, and they're actually not in place in the majority of Canadian institutions. And there's also been a lot of work around patient, patient and nurse navigation, implementing the role and also looking at whether it's effective or not and how it can be implemented. So beyond models of care interventions, nurses in Canada have very much led, uh, led, led nurse uh, psychosocial challenges, led interventions around psychosocial challenges. 
And the Cancer and Work Initiative is a great example. So it was uh, led by Christy Mayu from McGill in partnership with Maureen Parkinson at the BC Cancer Agency, who's a social worker. And this is an, a wonderful uh, resource for survivors as well as providers and employers. Another example that many of you are familiar work, is familiar with is um, Cameo, of course, developed by Dr. Linda Val Neves and with Tracy Truant involved along the way, uh, looking at decision making around complementary therapy for cancer patients inclusive of cancer survivors. So an area not traditionally focused on in other health, uh, by other healthcare professionals, but definitely an area that's important to cancer survivors. And one of, I think, the most important contributions that nursing has made in Canada is trying to bridge this knowledge to practice gap. And the two organizations that I think have really led the way are CAPO, which is the Canadian Association for Psychosocial Oncology. They have, uh, with the leadership of nurses, but also inclusive and working with our multidisciplinary colleagues, have developed a series of pan-Canadian guidelines to address those psychosocial issues that many cancer survivors are facing. And then also CANO, uh, the Canadian Association of Nurses in Oncology, uh, under the leadership of Tracy, I mean, we're so blessed that you've been able to do the work that you've done, but has really galvanized nursing to take up survivorship as their mandate and their priority in terms of research and practice. And it was really great. Yesterday, I got an email from the Survivorship Interest Group. And on the email were over 30 nurse researchers in the Survivorship Interest Group for CANO, which is actually, when you think about the numbers of, of nurse researchers and you think about the number uh, of people in Canada, that's a remarkable number. So I think that the, the groundswell is growing. So... Where to next in terms of areas of research? Well, I, th I think the first thing we need to recognize is that we actually need to build on our existing momentum and success. I think there's a lot to be celebrated and to be built upon. A couple of areas that I think are important, I mean, might just be my particular area of interest, but is to think about increasing survivor or provider and survivor knowledge, but not just in educational ways but in terms of integrating survivor perspectives into standard care. So the assessment of things that are important to survivors are included as part of care, and the processes are actually implemented that address those, those issues. I think we know a lot about psychosocial long-term and late effects. We know a lot about distress. We know a lot about fatigue, but we actually don't understand how that changes throughout the survivorship trajectory. And we don't know at what point is it actually the most important time to measure and capture distress, and at what times do people need help or don't need help. I think we need to increasingly look at models of care and tailored interventions. There's a number of great interventions, but we have to think about how can we make them more effective for individual and unique populations, but also how can we think about taking those interventions and scaling them up across organizations in a way that works. Because right now there's a lot of one-off interventions being tried and then like pilot studies, they tend to get dropped. And an area where I think we haven't necessarily done a good job, but I think we, especially being nurses, uh, are, are very capable of contributing to is in the area of special populations, specifically and particularly vulnerable populations. And we can do this by understanding the issues that are faced by those populations, but also the ways that those different populations may think that their needs need to be addressed. <clears throat> In terms of strategies, how might, might we do that? I'm going to borrow the words of the Pan-Canadian framework. Uh, they say to leverage the existing strengths and come together in a more coordinated and strategic fashion. So I think the best way for nurses to do that is through our existing organizations like CAPO and CANO, but also thinking about those international collaborations where we have shared issues across our healthcare systems. 
There's also been a lot of criticism in cancer survivorship that the knowledge has evolved because of individual researchers' interests and that that's a bad thing. I actually think it's a good thing uh, and I think it's important that we support researchers, individual researchers, to pursue, pursue original lines of research, especially when they're identified by our point of care nurse colleagues. Because then we come to understand those things that might be important that aren't on the radar of those larger uh, priorities. And as we all know, nothing happens without funding. So we have to continue to advocate for funding uh, through our organizations, but all through, also through, through things like our, our national funding agencies. And most importantly in Canada, and I don't think we've done a very good job of this, is we need to partner with our cancer organizations and our primary care providers. And that's because we need to ensure that cancer survivorship remains a priority. We also need to do this to identify those barriers to actually conducting research that exists today, because there are a number of them. Uh, and also, if we don't partner with, our, with our, our care organization and our primary care providers, we won't generate knowledge that can be integrated in a much easier fashion into, into, into care that exists. So I think I've kept it within my 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'll leave it there and turn it over to Christina. Um, and before I start, I think most of you know that the BC Cancer Agency has changed its name to BC Cancer. I'm going to say BC Cancer Agency the whole time, I'm sure, so uh, interchangeably. <coughs> Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, my name is Christina Morrison. I am a family nurse practitioner in primary care and oncology at uh, BC Cancer. I've been in this position since February of 2013. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of the survivorship nurse practitioner in cancer care, tell you a little bit about why and how we developed it, um, touch base on where we're at now after five years since its start, uh, briefly discuss what we've done in terms of evaluation of the survivorship nurse practitioner role and hopes to continue to do more with maybe some help of our fellow colleagues here. And then um, touch on a little bit about what, what I think can also be improved and tell you about some exciting survivorship clinics that are actually available within BC. So I think this is a really good lead in because we are doing a lot of work um, within the nurse practitioner world. So uh, I started this position February of 2013, but a few years before that, um, a campaign came out. You guys may be familiar with it. It's called the Nurse Practitioner for BC campaign. And funding was available to develop new roles within BC. And so the survivorship program at, the, at BC Cancer, which no longer exists as that name, it's now called... Fiona, if you can help me, is it interpersonal? Um, I, I don't know. No. Nope. Okay. Name for survivorship these days. Is there? Okay. Uh, all about patient, experience. patient experience. Oh, that. Okay. Sorry. I think we're under that umbrella term now. So Sorry. yeah. Sorry. Patient experience and, experience and interpersonal. Interprofessional. There we go. It's, that's everything. That's everything. Yeah. That's everything. Interprofessional practice is under everything that relates to people. To people. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're under somewhere. that. We're there somewhere. <laughs> um, they put in a proposal to the ministry to get funding for a uh, primary care nurse practitioner. Um, and in their research, they found that in the Vancouver area alone, there were about 700 unattached cancer survivors. Um, so unattached means that they do not have a family provider. So they were seeking primary care and emergency departments, uh, walk-in clinics, or with their primary oncologist. In the Fraser Valley, there was over 3,000. So it was quite a significant number. And so we were hoping that by introducing a, a primary care nurse practitioner that focused on these patients, we could overall improve adherence to surveillance recommendations, uh, help to address the managed survivorship concerns, and hopefully overall relieve some of the oncologists from managing primary care concerns. And overall, fingers crossed, decreasing wait times. So um, I started the role in February of 2013, like I mentioned, I'm in the Vancouver area. I'm at a clinic called the Vancouver Practice Center. Um, my colleague Jill Matheson started her role out in Surrey at the Jim Pattison Outpatient Care and Surgery Center in October 2013. And then Colleen Riley, who's just over there, uh, started in Vancouver as well in, in early 2016. 
When we had funding for the third nurse practitioner, we tried for 18 months to get the position somewhere other than in the lower mainland because there's obviously food in everywhere. Finding an appropriate partner was difficult um, and the funding was being threatened to be taken away. So we put another one in Vancouver and there's a need. Um, but um, we're hoping that through some additional evaluation, we can expand the role because there's everyone in BC that needs it. And of course, our overall purpose was to provide primary care to unattached cancer survivors. So just a quick description of our practices now. Um, in the Vancouver Clinic, between myself and Colleen, we have about 400 patients. Um, and in the Surrey Clinic, Jill has about 180. So we've attached 600 patients at this time. But over the last five years, we've obviously attached more as people have moved on or, or passed on. Uh, the role was very challenging to get up and running. It did probably take about six or seven months to get a first patient referral when I first started. Uh, there was a lot of struggle with nurse practitioner rule description, differentiating us between nurse practitioner versus LPN versus RN, getting the trust of the oncologist and patients to, to give us those referrals. So it took a little while to get up and running, but happy to say that we have referrals coming in from oncologists and patients themselves at least one or two a week now. Um, and between two mat leaves and one coming up, um, we do have about a four to five month wait list. So we're trying to get through those. Um, so definitely there's still a need. Um, so we're happy to see the success of this role so far. About a year in to my role starting in February 2013, we decided to evaluate it by doing a patient satisfaction survey. Something that we thought would be easy to administer, quick, cheap, um, and give us some, some answers uh, right away. So we decided to use the Baron Bowers client satisfaction tool, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We went with this tool because it was actually developed for a nurse practitioner model and it had previously been used in a, an NP clinic uh, within PHSA. Confirm validity, validity and reliability, so we thought it would be something that would be appropriate. This tool does focus on kind of four domains, effective support, health information, decisional control, and technical competencies. And we decided to add in accessibility, overall satisfaction with care, and then an open-ended comment box. And I'm not going to go through kind of all the results, although the open-ended comment box was quite interesting. The majority of the comments were still about the confusion between a nurse practitioner and a GP. So we have continued to educate our population, the oncologists, um, our colleagues, and I'm hoping that eventually uh, we'll get there. Um, difficult to see, but that is the questionnaire. Um, and our results. So overall, we, we tend to see higher results of patient satisfaction surveys, but um, between my role 2014, Jill 2015, and Colleen in 2017, um, Colleen's scale is a little bit different there. Very overall, different. Yeah. Scale is different. <laughs> I did. I was like, <laughs> um, didn't know how to figure out the scale. I'm not tech savvy. Um, but overall, 90 plus percentile um, with kind of all the six domains. So we were really happy to see that. And patients have been overall satisfied with, with their care at, uh, by primary care nurse practitioners. So before I go there, there, there are, you know, we, within the last five years, we've had so many suggestions about continuing evaluation. We've wanted to see decreased wait times with the oncologist, emergency visits saved. Um, one oncologist had a great idea to see if we're saving the system money because we have access to CASE, which is their EMR, to see if we aren't ordering things duplicate because we can see that they've just had a CT scan or blood work. Um, so we are excited that now we have the research portfolio and we can maybe tack onto that and get some help in, in developing some more evaluation criteria because I think there's lots to evaluate and um, in, increase our chances of getting additional funding to put more of us around BC. So improvement opportunities. Um, so before I touch on what we have been doing additionally, I talked to my colleagues and we had a couple of nurse practitioner meetings last week and these are the common, some of the things that kind of came up. So like I've said, access to survivorship nurse practitioners, primary care providers throughout the province. 
Um, I was part of focus groups a couple years ago, and many GPs, family GPs, came to those focus groups and said that they just did not feel confident in providing primary care to cancer survivors because maybe they had one breast cancer survivor in their thousand patient population or two lymphoma patients. So it's about getting those primary care providers, and you touched on this as well, to be more confident in that skill set. Um, and that kind of leads into the second point of standardized discharge summaries. The BC, uh, BC Cancer uh, Breast Cancer Tumor Group has done a fantastic job in the last three year, last few years of having a standardized discharge summary. So uh, primary nurse practitioners, GPs, get kind of clear instructions of mammogram due here and annually, breast exam due annually, and it just gives the provider a little bit more confidence. Um, I understand that that is tricky to do for all tumor groups um, because there are so many challenges, but something along those lines would be helpful. Resources have always come up as I see my patients every day. Um, not only just resources in general, but free resources. So a lot of them are financially strained with going through cancer treatment um, and don't have the ability to pay for or the time to, or know exactly where to even start to look for uh, resources such as physio, massage, lymphatic drainage, um, financial support, return to work, and things like that. Uh, at BC Cancer, we have a lot of resources for patients. We're very proud of that. Um, but once they get discharged after five years, it's challenging to find these support systems for them, including psychiatry and, and counseling. And then a centralized follow-up program for tumor group. Again, something that would be so amazing to have, probably not as realistic right now, but um, I'll go on to tell you a little bit about we're, what we're doing per tumor group. But um, if there was some sort of transition program or a nurse practitioner in a transition clinic, I think that that would be amazing as well. So some of the exciting things that we are doing, aside from the survivorship nurse practitioners, uh, we started the LEAF program, I believe, maybe three-ish years ago. Uh, that is led by Dr. Karen Goddard and a nurse practitioner named Kimberly Ann Reed. It stands for Late Effects Assessment and Follow-Up Clinic. So they recalled all cancer survivors, childhood cancer survivors within BC, and are continuing to see them after they've been discharged from BC Children's Hospital, which is I believe 18, 19 years old. Um, and so they follow up just on childhood cancer survivors, and they've been uh, doing a really great job. And I'm happy to send my patients to them as well, because they're usually quite challenging. The long-term follow-up uh, bone marrow transplant clinic, that started up about three years ago as well, kind of had some uh, trouble with, um, I think, I don't know if it was funding or staff, but now they've kind of got it all set up. They've just hired a nurse practitioner named Michael, um, and he'll be working there with some of GPs as well. Um, and that's to focus on patients uh, who have had a bone marrow transplant, day 100 and moving forward. Uh, focusing on graft versus host disease symptoms, surveillance of reoccurrence, and secondary malignancies. So that is amazing as well because they tend to be quite complex patients. After breast cancer is something brand new, uh, donor funded for three years. It's led by Anita Dotz, who's a nurse practitioner. So these are all nurse practitioner clinics. Uh, she's at a BC Women's Hospital and she's going to focus on hormone positive breast cancer patients post treatment. So, dealing with the long term side effects um, of adjuvant hormone therapy. And we know that there's uh, a lot of side effects that patients can um, experience. And then, this AYA. Um, Adult, young adult, right now they're kind of getting it up and running to provide support for these, this population during treatment, but talking to uh, their program leader, they're really hoping that they can build a survivorship clinic moving forward. So fingers crossed on that as well. So there's lots of great things going on. Uh, nurse practitioners are very heavily involved um, with these clinics, which is fantastic. And that's everything for me. Thank you. around your your QUT chair. 
um, you know, duration, expectation, and, and, and I guess added to that, but just like, I'm noticing your word, your name is moving from first to last in order. And I'm just, I'm wondering if, if that is a reflection of the invention of moving to a hospital? Yeah. Anyway, I just, I just, just, uh, yeah. No, uh, the, for the first name and last name authorship is just uh, it's just a thing that that we need to do when we start mentoring people and they don't necessarily need to be clinicians. And of course, they could be clinicians. Um, but uh, in the chair role, other than your own research, um, it is really around building capacity. Um, so part of my role is actually to encourage postgraduate studies. Um, and we're very proud to say that we have 75% of our cancer nurses pursuing or having already got a postgraduate qualifications. Um, so that's postgraduate certificate all the way to PhDs. Um, so that's one part of big role that I actually sit down one-on-one -on -one with all the APNs and above to talk to them about, about their career planning and their studies, uh, their study plan. Um, so that's part of my role. The second part of my role is to do the research, uh, both doing the research and mentoring others to do their research. Some of my publications were even um, uh, collaboration with clinicians who are not necessarily pursuing a master's or PhD. It's just what they do as an APN. Um, research is part of their role, and I think that's those sort of expectation. Um, yeah, so I'm very, very lucky that I know that I sort of went into this hospital with that has already got a foundation that people are expected to do research and study. So um, it is easier for me, um, I guess. But I've been, I've been in this city, um, um, sort of um, in a similar hospital, doing similar things over the past ten years. Um, so when I went to the to the neighbor hospital, it was so much easier because they know me and I've really worked with them. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the hospital pay for 70% of my wages and the, and the university pay 30. But in my previous chair role, uh, it was 50 50. So it was just more of a negotiation. But essentially, what the hospital does is to put out an APN level salary. And then the university, which maybe form around 50% of the professorial salary, and then the university pay the other half. And fixed term five years. Fixed term five years. Yeah, we don't do tenure anymore. In at the professorial level in our faculty, we we stop doing that. Yeah. 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 Um, I just say that I think that we're totally reactive. We were to we are totally reactive to that. We have no one with that expertise. Um, so I'm working with Roman McGuire, who is from the UK, um, who is a professor of e-health, um, to help us train PhDs in that area that can help us design a course into the future and to do research in this area. But one thing that we need to establish too is that there is a whole heap of data, too much data. And I think we, what we really need to work on is what are some of the earlier indicators during treatment? Um, for example, one of the things is financial toxicity. What are the commonly reported things already? Or can we add one or two more questions in there that can help us predict those people who are going to do worse in financial toxicity? Um, and I think there is a lot of room for us to do that. But we are so reactive that we haven't even gone there yet. I think that's interesting because like, I have my PhD in or bring to nursing, and there's such a everyone works in such yeah, uh, like vacuums in basic research. But like when I was looking at genomics, and like you do have so much genomic data, 
and no one's really, like, people are trying to pull out these different things from them that aren't really relevant to patient care or patient experience. And that's stuff, but it's more about, like, finding these answers to, like, what chemotherapy is going to work great for that patient, which is a great, like, physician question in some ways, but, like, from a nursing perspective, it's much more, like, how are, how's nausea, how bad is their nausea going to be, like, that kind of thing. Yeah, agree. Totally agree. Not just blood nausea, but your nausea. Yeah. <laughs> totally agree. I think one of the is main issues in Canada is the healthcare silos. So yeah, if someone's in cancer care settings, they have access, their providers have access to those records. But if a cancer survivor is admitted to, you know, a general medical ward or needs intensive care or any of those other things, those providers are not looking at their history. Cancer, and and many times they're not even incorporating that into their their care plans going forward. So it's mm -hmm. the, the records and, and um, knowledge around their, their history is lost. Um, I also want to say the opportunity might well be, and I think I'm learning. Um, to work with our physician colleagues when they start their project, when they are already collecting blood, how can we add one more tube? How can we add one more symptom question or experience question into it? Because they get millions of dollars, right? It's easier for them, right? But then how can I ask a supportive care question related to their genome, you know, or their gene expression study? Um, and I'm learning that um, at the moment. But I need to learn how to speak the lingo and all those sort of stuff, which is why I went to San Francisco to learn um, about all that. Well, I'm, and I'm sure by, by inserting yourself into their conversation, you'll find many that are interested and intrigued, and so you can create some enthusiasm for the you know, being more proactive and putting those in the first place. Yeah. Can I have one more? No. Uh, uh, Fisher, um, can you say a bit about port? Because literally, yeah. I reckon 60 70% of the names you put up there. Yeah, that, and that, that was that an oversight, I should Port or alumni, aren't they? Yeah, so. Um, CIHR funded a strategic training initiative in psychosocial oncology. I believe it started in 2004, about, about there. Uh, and they were really addressing the issue of increasing capacity of nurse researchers. And they had other health disciplines, and uh, you were a mentor, John, right? Yeah. And so that program lasted for at least 10 years. And the names of the individuals I have for examples Many, uh, probably about 70%, were those trainees. So it was in psychosocial oncology, very focused on nurse research, and it, it capitalized on building a community uh, of, of people who were capable of moving the, the research agenda forward. But what was so great is you make connections with people. So you weren't just a lone researcher who was interested in something. You knew and had access to mentors and other people who might have similar. So that was a tremendous uh, bump in terms of cancer, cancer care and cancer research. First of all, thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm not from the oncology world, and I was very fascinated to see some of the common themes that we see across the spectrum. I'd be really interested to hear how you operationalize the whole content of patient engagement in, the, in your research and maybe in your clinical work as well. Uh, because there's much talk about that, and I think we have much to learn from each other in terms of breaking down those patterns of care. So the concept of patient engagement, maybe shared decision making, maybe the reporting of patient recorded outcomes, how do you make that a real component of your research programs and possibly your clinical practice? It's a big question. I just, <laughs> just like to get a flavor of some of the things that, that might be happening in our college. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I, you know, we provide primary care for patients, so it's a, just very clinically focused. Um, so we involve patients in the decision making of every aspect of their health care, and we encourage them to be advocates for their own health. Um, but in terms of documenting and recording and, and reporting patient outcomes, we, we haven't gotten there yet. But it's, I'm Are sure these survivors as part of sort of advisory to how the, the primary care survivors are programs going? No. So we have not had any working groups aside from getting the role up and running. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's something to consider for sure. I think in the olden days, before you actually yeah. are 
than there are now. There were survivors, um, but I think that's coming. Yeah. Well, and can I, or you mentioned the LEAP clinic, with, yeah. which is the Childhood Cancer and Long Term Follow Up yeah. Clinic. One of the main reasons that it actually exists is because the advocacy that's work right. of parents. You know, there were three business. Uh, plans that were proposed prior to um, patients and survivors getting involved and going to media and government and advocating for that. And only then, when survivors themselves were involved, did it become a reality. Yeah, it was a great group that got together mm -hmm. and did wonderful things. Mm -hmm. So I do think patients have such a strong voice and they need to be involved. And you were saying in some of the research that they've done, they didn't even include patients or nurses. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to remember that that's an important uh, population to have. I'll give you two quick examples. Um, one project that we're very excited about is, um, is experience-based co-design uh, study uh, to address financial toxicity. So um, at the moment in the financial toxicity literature, there is very little on agreed roles. Uh, so financial toxicity for people who are not in the oncology setting, um, it is to describe financial distress and hardship as a result of cancer diagnosis or treatment, uh, which in turn then limits your treatment options and your psychosocial health. Um, so uh, we are involving patients, uh, we're capturing patients' experiences, um, and we show the experiences back to an MDT to a multidisciplinary team like this with the patient, with social workers, not-for-profit organizations, employers. Um, so we have some of those resources as well around helping people to return to work or what have you. But what we want to do is to create a clinical pathway for people from the beginning of diagnosis to the end of life in terms of the financial help that they can get from different members of the healthcare team. So we're engaging them to design care rather than just interviewing them. So we want them to co-design care with with the care with the healthcare professionals. So that's one one project that we are very, very um, happy about. Uh, that comes from King's College. So the um, the method of it comes from King's College from the UK. Another project that we do is around a self-management framework. So we have a training program for APNs to deliver motivational interviewing um, to engage patients in self-management, which is what we are using in our uh, in our uh, clinic, in our nurse clinic for survivorship, in that intervention, we we set goals with them, and we um, and we evaluate it as we go, uh, as we go, and encourage them to engage in self management behaviors. I was thinking as you were saying that that uh, I don't, I'm not aware of Canada as playing much of a role in financial toxicity research because of course we have this illusion that because we have a publicly funded healthcare system where <laughs> everything's available to everyone. It's, it's sort of interesting that overlay of our of our wider culture and the kind of arrogance to assume that we don't have the same kinds of problems. So it's wonderful to hear the international perspective. Um, yeah, and so I you behind that. Um, well, just. Just thank you for that, that question because uh, I think what it, <coughs> what it took out of it a little bit, even though it was a big question, um, was that how, how can we, people in practice and people with a, a greater focus on research, come together to really um, enable us to improve cancer care overall? And I think. Much like there are silos, you know, between all the disciplines, there are sometimes silos in that world too. And I know that's been your vision at NBC Cancer to, you know, really engage with our uh, practitioners overall, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, you know, all the, the sort of the healthcare um, frontline yeah. staff in all the disciplines. And so, you know, I think that this kind of talk just generates in my mind a lot of opportunities for how we might move things ahead. And I just want to say that with NBC in general, many of you may be aware there is a real move and a real shift um, and from the Ministry of Health to move toward more team-based approaches to primary care that incorporate all the right members of the team. And so I just feel like there's, there's this is a, such a timely talk because there's so much opportunity and we just have to have the right people in the right places to make things happen. 
absolutely true. And you know, and, and, and as we know, it requires like nursing professional associations to get in there and make sure nursing is part of it. Exactly. And I guess the other piece, thinking back to, to Sandra's question, Grace Sandra is one of the people that has it. One of the very few people in this province that has something that is funded, co-funded by the, the, the School of Nursing and the St. Paul's Hospital or Providence Health. So she's the closest thing we have to the kind of chair model that we're talking about. And, and I, I, I actually think that, that that vision of having someone who has two, two reporting, with double reporting relationship is, is the aspiration that many of us have. We would, we would very much like to move in that direction. Canada, and especially BC, has not been able to manage those very successfully historically, not the way Australia has been able to do it. Just different history and tradition. We'll get there. Just to, just to add about the piece around patient engagement, from the research uh, perspective, you know, there's this huge push around uh, strategy for patient-oriented research and including, um, including part, uh, patients and participants as part and co-owners and co-developers of the research. And I'm engaged in one project, it's not related to cancer survivorship, but we are partnering with, with, our, with our patient uh, partners and one of the things that's become really evident is that you can't just involve patients and expect them to know what to do and to contribute that there's a whole area of research and and a, an appetite to figure out how do we do that best how do we engage with people in a way that you know capitalizes on their strengths but also that, that makes them comfortable and um, their their um, contribution is meaningful for them so I think that's a whole area of research that will be brought into cancer care. There was a question behind that. Yeah, I mean, actually, maybe I'll start with an introduction because um, I will get to answer my question. Um, so my name is Rachel Murphy, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Population Public Health. Um, so my question is more around integration of nurse researchers, because I think, you know, really about what you said, it is important to have this, you know, interdisciplinary lens and building these teams, and I think that's one thing that um, I've been struggling with, and I think other teams well, um, I'm likely one of the only ones who's not in nursing in this room. I'm not exactly sure how the invitation found its way to me, but I was glad it did. I was really <laughs> in um, presentation. So, um, some of the, I, I don't primarily work in survivorship, but I do uh, do some research work with um, a prostate cancer survivorship program at the MBC. Um, and there's not a lot of involvement from nurse researchers in it. Um, so, I mean, there's nurses that are obviously involved in the program, but not on the research side. So I guess my question is more around um, involvement of nurse research, researchers in projects, not even just in survivorship, but you know, how how do we make sure that that's part of um, teams? Uh, are there ways to meaningful, meaningfully integrate nurse researchers? And are there areas where this is done particularly well that we can look to for models or frameworks and things like that? And they would be interesting to get each of your perspectives on that. If there are I don't know if people maybe figure this out in other fields, then I'm just not <laughs> sure uh, the best way. I think with our role, and we've said this several times, it would have been fantastic to set up some evaluation criteria before we even started the role. So we could have started to collect that data. And when we first started, we had working groups every two weeks, and we did have um, an oncologist, uh, Dr. Winston Chung, who was very interested in research on our working group. And that just kind of fell apart as the time went on. Um, but I think it, it's vital to have the team set up even before the role is developed so that we can start to collect that data from day one. Because now the challenging thing is five years down the road, how do we go back and get all that data when we weren't collecting it? There probably may not even be a means to get some of the data that we want. So I think that is very important. Um, I don't know who organizes that, where that comes from, the funding, but I think it's very important. I'll jump in unless you want to go for it. Yeah, I just want to say, I think we had a slightly unusual in cancer nursing in British Columbia over the time, for a period of time, um, there was not uh, system level support for nurses being actively involved in research. Um, uh, as we um, grew nurse practitioner roles, which is fantastic, but the, the, the sequela of it was to lose CNS roles. And clinical nurse specialists is the, is the group that comes with some research training and research in the portfolio to be able to engage. So there, there actually were antibodies against nursing participation in research for some period of time, and that's an administrative philosophy um, that we can, I 
could speak about at length, but I have, I'm very convinced that we have moved past that. We have uh, a more enlightened kind of leadership um, at, the, at the thing that isn't the agency. Um, we have, <laughs> we have lots of um, people inspired to rebuild that. So we're in an unusual time. I think we're at a point of active rebuilding that's really quite exciting and looking for more opportunities to structure nursing roles so that there's a, there's a um, feasible active engagement in research and also to rebuild the relationships with the university because during that period of time when research wasn't on the radar, there was also not much interest in collaboration with the university. Um, and you know, I'll just, just to give an example of the extent of it, that in my program of research, which was quite collaborative, we had oncologists and members, other members of the healthcare team from, from the agency involved in that research, the nurse leaders who had uh, expressed an interest and were part of the proposals were saying things like, if it gets funded, just let me know in case I have to remove my name from that before we make it public. So um, I think it's important just to realize that we've had this odd history and that um, it, it played itself out and nurses do clinical work on research and that we've, we've got an opportunity now to rebuild that. So it's very exciting time. And just because we haven't done it in the past decade doesn't mean that it's not going to happen very quickly. Do you want to add to that? Or? Just that the research that you want to do has got to be founded in clinical care. And it can't only be this really small population that you talked about um, in terms of, you know, 100 plus um, patients on bone marrow transplant. AYA, newly, new breast cancer patients. So that's a very small population of the bigger population of people living with and beyond cancer um, after they finish their treatment. So I think when we bring together those oncology nurses who have high levels of research and practice in a clinical setting, we may be able to build and bring something more better for our patients and families there as opposed to these little pieces here and there. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> I do have a quick thought too, um, in addition to what has been shared, um, I think it is around articulating um, to encourage interdisciplinary or interprofessional cancer survivorship research is to articulate the benefits, not, not general benefits, because we all know that it is beneficial for us to collaborate, but specific benefits in the context of cancer survivorship. And I'll give you one example. Um, uh, Christina mentioned about um, about the, the rates of people getting um, guidelines recommended care, uh, getting surveillance tests that are guidelines recommended. Um, um, and Tracy was so nice to link me up with Mary McBride um, here, and she has already got multiple, multiple years and years of data of where the benchmark is in terms of recommended uh, surveillance tests, whether we are doing it over or below the standard or we are doing it as standard. So wouldn't it be interesting for us to compare the nurse practitioner model, because you have to have a comparison, right, when you actually evaluate something. Otherwise, it would be a description. Um, it would be so interesting to look at where the benchmark is to start off with and to look at what, what we're, so I think articulating that as one of the benefits is going to help the team to come together because everyone has something um, sort of shared, a shared goal, which is really around what Fusha was saying, um, you know, as, as one of the key priorities that will articulate that. Um. So, um, my name is Will, I'm, I'm a science student here, um, but I've always been a super tech person, and so, like, a lot of the work I do is, like, automated with computer stuff, and one of my good friends in Texas, he uses what are called the like, Deep Neural Networks to review patients' charts and predict the pharmaceutical use for these companies. And so in the discussion today, I see a lot of opportunity for technology that I'm able to see because I have like a tech background. And I see that there's some critical opportunity for things like reviewing patients' charts, predicting outcomes proactively in terms of what, um, what their experiences are going to be, if they're going to have nausea issues, and I know that those technologies exist and that they're applicable to your situation. Um, how do you think that you can best go about accessing those people's special expertise? So my friend has a 
think it's like close to six years of computer science education in order to create these deep neural networks. And he doesn't have any idea about like what are meaningful like numbers needed to treat or any type of a medical language. But he has such a an ability to use these technologies to actually meaningfully impact patient care. How do you think we can partner <coughs> computer science students, uh, IT, other partnerships in terms of getting ahead of the issue because the technology exists and people's money are using it <laughs> to make more money in terms of the students and everything. How do you think that we can do that? We need to do better at it, there's no doubt. And um, I think if we are not quick enough, that entrepreneurs will lead it. And I, I'm worried because we have got this new app developer called Cancerate, and it might have already come to Canada already that you might not be aware of because these, um, these actually were started by oncology residents, two people who became an entrepreneur who actually uh, started offering this app for free to cancer patients and cancer survivors. And so they're all standardized measures with PROs, ESAS measures or what have you. And now that they have accumulated, you know, I wouldn't say hundreds of thousands, but thousands and thousands of patients in our catchment area and internationally in the US and different places. And, but because they offered it for free to patients, patients sign up and then now they're selling it back to the health services. Because health, health, health services don't have that data, and now they're held in ransom. They're held ransom because now they have to pay a lot of money for that. And they wouldn't charge $1 per app because mm -hmm. if you have 40,000 patients, they will only earn $40,000, which is not their end game. Mm -hmm. Their end game is to earn hundreds of thousands of dollars from the health services. So I think that if we don't lead it, and it, that's what I was saying, I think it needs to be clinicians who tell, who lead this interdisciplinary efforts. and. Um, and we need to lead that before other people actually do lead it because we know the patient's experience. We don't want to be held ransom. We want the funds mm -hmm. to be used for better cause. I, I was just saying that this is our patient's data. How can you just collect it and now come back and sell it to us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, That's a really good point about how rare the skill set is mm -hmm. and how hard it is to connect. Yeah. Surely we who are here in faculty of applied science with yeah. new school of biomedical engineering and you know, geeks who really do get excited about this kind of stuff and don't know what we nurses know, surely we can figure out a way to do that. Yeah. It is already happening in some places, though, in the UK, and we know that uh, Roma McGuire is doing a lot of work um, in that space. But uh, I think talking to people with a different lingo, we, we need yeah. to be very courageous in asking questions. Um, yeah, Working with health economists, working with genetics people, we just need to learn. We don't need to be an expert in that. We just need to learn how to work with them. Chris, like even your question about like, how do we improve GP expertise or their confidence in that? And like you said, that kind of having that standardized report for breast cancer screening and what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Like that's all doable with technology with a review of a chart and an automated deep neural network to predict and just like recommend these screenings for people. Like that can be done. There is there is such a huge gap between what is happening now and where we need to be. I'll give you an example. We recently did a chart review of some tour groups. We are looking for discharge summaries. And we are trying to look at what was in those discharge summaries for care that would be provided by the GP or the primary care provider. Only 30% even had a discharge summary. So we're talking about we need electronic medical records, we need all these things, but we've totally missed the boat in terms of capturing data. Mm. So, and as Ray said, entrepreneurs will fill that space and are. Uber health, Uber yeah. survivors. <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel, to play devil's advocate about that, I feel like there's a lot of patient specific, like everyone as an individual, we can't, we can't fully automate it. Right? And so I know there's even within the tumor groups, there was no conflict about what kind of recommendation should be given, who is the evidence, is the evidence isn't there, one or the other, but that's beyond even what is necessary for the patient in terms of patient specific follow up and needs and stuff. So we can leave that for now. No, that, that, that's a really important nursing. We 
lens because I think that anything that would cause us to lose that capacity to individualize care is giving up. Um, I think that, um, you know, notwithstanding the complexity of the clinical setting, which is like to change a form in a hospital's environment causes 20 committees uh, years of grief, and then you can have one page with one item slightly different at the end of it. Um, so there's, you know, that implementation process that can be challenging. Um, but I think what that means is from a research point of view, there's you know all of this stuff you know, like you know that there's fatigue guidelines and that people ought to be doing these kinds of things that are evidence-based when they have fatigue. And there's probably that for like many symptoms, you, you have a list of guidelines there. Um, I'm just wondering what your sense is of how much nurses at BC Cancer or in primary care environments actually use that information to provide care for patients versus some nurses researchers have done enough research to know these are the right things to do. What is the distance between um, knowing what appropriate care is and nurses being super involved from a research point of view and that translating to practice change and proactive activity by nurses who are caring for patients directly? So I actually think that we need to shift the way we think about responsibilities for implementing and providing evidence-based care from individuals to systems. So I think it shouldn't be left to individual nurses to go look at these guidelines and figure out how they're going to incorporate it into their care. I think it's a system problem. Those guidelines need to be part of their daily care, need to be, needs to be integrated in how that care is provided, and I think that comes from organizations and worker systems. The, the data that they charge. Yeah, yeah, and roles and responsibilities and time and resources that are provided for them to be able to do that. I just, like, my experience in the cancer care system has been I have not seen a lot of nurses. I think a little bit depends on what kind of treatment they're getting in the And I, I totally 100% care from this. But I think we need to get patient involved in creating that system so that we have a nice overarching mm -hmm. perspective and so that he patients and families will engage with some nurses, others will engage with Fuchsia and other people who will actually create these systems of care and research. So I've done a lot of work. Building on the work that Ray and Christina are Ray and Christina, for <laughs> sure, and all your colleagues. Like, I, I can just see this big, we have about 10 years. Perfect. That's about how long. Is that okay? That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, I think, an increasing awareness. Certain panels have lots of discussions about it. That, that, um, Patients are different with regard to the extent to which they will catch a nurse at all in a minor cancer journey. And that for those who don't, just by virtue of the nature of their own treatment path, there, there's an increased risk. And we haven't figured out how to be able to demonstrate that in a way that could help the system recognize that the access to nursing and being touched by the nurse is as important as the other things that we tend to think of as essential. It's not there yet. So I have a curiosity question because you referred to advanced nursing practice a lot with um, me. I didn't hear you use the word NP, and we use the word CNS. So I'm, and I I travel a lot in Australia, and I have caught the odd program that basically dumped on NPs there and said that they were physician assistants and people should run screening in the other direction. So I'm just wondering um, what. When you talk about ANS, advanced nurse or ANPs, what are you referring to? Uh, we call them nurse. I was, I thought that they would be more commonly known term. That's why I used it. But in Australia, we don't use that at all. We use uh, clinical nurse consultants. So they are the same. We have got one rank uh, shared by, which is very different to your system here, shared by the nurse, uh, nurse manager, nurse educators, nurse researchers. We have, we have actually got nurse researchers in the hospital as well who are at the same level, clinical nurse consultants. Um, they are at the same same level. And then we have nurse practitioner um, who is getting paid higher than them. Um, but essentially all of them, um, which is that band and above, are supposed to be advanced practice nurses. So we uh, 
regardless of what the title is, we are encouraging people and we are every year we are doing the appraisal. When we're doing appraisal with them, we use a strong model of advanced practice nursing, whereby we look at how much uh, advanced direct care uh, education, research, support of systems, or the quality improvement type of things um, to assess them on these domains. Because we are saying that just because you hold an advanced practice role, it doesn't mean that you are functioning uh, in advanced practice. practice. So we are helping everyone to to improve in those domains. Thank you. In a cancer center volunteer, um, not here, but like in Saskatoon. And I was so excited, but I felt like I spent most of my time serving juice, but like compassion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I have so much, I feel like they're a great resource, but it's free and can be trained. And, you know, we have these pamphlets, and people kind of like look at this wall of information that's overwhelming, but maybe, you know, we can better utilize resources that we already have. Um, for that kind of thing. Um, because we don't have maybe a nurse with enough time to like go and like because everyone spends so much time waiting for the getting cancer infant. They spend so much time thinking about that in waiting rooms and just like like that time can be better spent by our system and by the patient. Like to get cancer time. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm always interested the moderator here, but I also have opinions. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about, about qualitative research and the general idea of patient experience research as close as you can get to it is that there's so much that that provides with regard to helping us understand what we do in systems, like where we miss opportunities, what the messages are, um, you know, all of that, all that community of things. How you set up a waiting room to communicate something about who's valuable and time and all of that. So um, I think that I really think that we need to just figure out how to increase our capacity to continue to work in that direction because every single uh, patient forum or, or patient group that starts to put forward recommendations starts to notice that. There's, there's wasted resources, there's opportunities missed, there's that human experience bit that got to get missed in certain places. So I think there's huge, huge potential for us to keep figuring out where the places to study and how to engage with patient groups and then how to try and figure out how to build that into systems. So I'm absolutely convinced that particularly in the clinician communication domain, there's an awful lot we can be doing differently that doesn't command significant resources. But it's about systems and skills and figuring out who the appropriate, what the appropriate kinds of leaders are, how we support the nurses and kinds of positions that can manage that better and all that kind of stuff. It's not it doesn't change their pay scale to be able to, <laughs> to be able to do the work that they should be doing. So okay. a lot of the discussion has been like, aimed towards like, the working line, not only working with people who like women uh, conditions and how there's a lot of work that's been done in terms of the patient for outcome measures and experience measures in terms of working with cancer survivors. That's a very similar population group in terms of dealing with organ failure and um, in terms of polypharmacy and other things. A lot of work has been done in terms of like model of care delivery and utilizing uh, healthcare resources and strategic particularly. Do you think there's opportunity for translation of some of that work? Or do you think that there's opportunity to also get back to that work in terms of the cancer population? In terms of specifically what I know. Do you know I know? It's um uh, I can't remember the proper name of it, but it's a sentence. Initiative for Palliative Project. So saying evidence. So it's, it's, it's the whole spectrum of chronic and life limiting condition and using a palliative approach to the goals of care. Uh, and it's been, it's been very well led in this province by Kelly Stadjahar and, and many other people. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm not all that familiar with bipedal and the palliative approach, but you touched on patient reported outcomes. And one of the issues in cancer care, and, and patient reported outcomes are increasingly. Um, included as part of care in all, probably all organizations across Canada anyway. The issue is that we don't yet know what 
um, those actual patient reported outcomes ought to be at different points and different trajectories for different groups. And we also don't know how to react to those patient reported outcomes. So you may identify that you have, you know, 30% of your population is distressed, but does that mean that they need a referral to patient and family counseling? What type of service do they need? So, so it creates um, more of a need, and I think that we have to work with our, our organizations to come to a place where creating more of a need is an okay thing and might actually be something that uh, organizations are interested in addressing and have the resources to do so. Well, one of the cool things about the AI panel approach is I think we've been able to pretty clearly establish that if you pay serious attention across that full spectrum of, of illness to the goals of care and quality of life on an individualized basis, you really can set up individualized plans that save resources. So you know, that's you know, unnecessary hospitalizations and that kind of thing. So I, I do think that there's likely an economic <coughs> in actually meeting patient need rather than allowing systems that ignores patient need. And we need, we need more of us that are building that kind of um, economic analysis. And it's probably already happening, and Tracy probably is biting her tongue because um, there is a whole heap of work um, from a palliative care perspective um, led by Michael McKenzie at BC Cancer. Um, and part of that project is around um, applying the palliative care approach. Um, and I think that is um, it's difficult from our perspective in Australia. Um, there's so much debate, and actually internationally, around survivorship and supportive care palliative care and from my perspective regardless of what we call it <laughs> anything that can help you get to advance the care I think we just roll with it you know this financial toxicity stuff we call it something new mm -hmm. it's not new the literature is not new around financial distress and financial hardship it's been 20 years or more in the literature but because that helps us advance the agenda so we yeah. call it so we call it that um, but you also have a gentleman um, in cancer who is a psycho oncologist um, who has done the whole distress screening um, Barry yeah Barry you know and that model and that model I think that it could it could be a good try for the survivorship um, population and at mask what we are doing at the moment is we're going to start a PRO survey uh, around implementation to ask people internationally what they're doing once they have collected the PRO what they're doing with it um, so it will be very good yeah. if you can answer <laughs> and send it to people who can answer yeah well, the, the part that I know about that that is, is that um, unfortunately you get into the screening of being able to actually have something to scream to, so that the level of distress you can increase if people tick off that I've got a very high level of spiritual distress or, or something else, and the system doesn't respond. I mean, that's yep. sort of the telehealth right. model of being able to do things that are still in the research domain as opposed to built into clinical systems. So, mm -hmm. And timing is so important. Yeah. So right now, it's common practice to screen people once when they start. And perhaps, depending on where the testing of the patient reported outcome in is, is in the population, perhaps again towards the end of treatment, but we don't know if that's the right, right time. We don't know if the stress will have changed. Well, perhaps we miss the month after treatment ends when the stress yeah. is probably very high. But, and you're right, Sally, like at cancer agencies, there's been now on cancer, there's now been like kind of a cutoff of um, psychosocial support after 15 months post treatment. It's all like that. Yeah, like all of our patients, it's like forget about it. I mean, we ask one-offs all the time, but you know, people because are, people are, sometimes people are at the peak of their anxiety five years out. Oh, I know. And, yeah. What we see is that people are so overwhelmed by treatment that they don't even have time to reflect or think about how it's affecting them. And it is two, three, four plus years later where we're trying to access these resources from patients and we have nothing. Yeah. And that's when they actually need it the most. Well, in, tre in treatment, in treatment, at least you're embracing the arms of, uh, of people who know what they're doing, who understand cancer. So there's yeah. that safety of yeah. being in a system and uh, relative void in yeah. safety. 
you're dealing with the unattached patient, but the attached patients also have the challenge of going back to the very provider that the oncology system probably told them they didn't know what they were doing when they first, when they first got diagnosed. So mm. we, we've got this real disconnect between those two systems. And so, of course, distress can increase. We get a lot of requests for people. Like Our standard is unattached, but... I don't know how many times a month we the patients phone and say, I have a family doctor. I just don't, don't want to trust. see them. Yeah. They yeah. missed my cancer. Or, and so, yeah. but, you know, we're not in the, the mm -hmm. business to patient steal, uh, but we also want patients to feel comfortable. So and we, get care. And get, and and get, get care. Exactly. So well, we you've got a long wait list. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have that discussion and we'll see you in a bit. But we do ask them to have a discussion with their family doctor, letting them know that they've decided to switch providers so that it doesn't look like it's us. Mm -hmm. Um, but we want them to have care, so if they're not getting care there, we want to provide it. But it's it's very true. Well, I, I know that it's harder to too, and especially the panelists haven't had a chance to get up much. <laughs> so um, I, I, the room is still available. We can stay and talk, and if any of you have questions, you can have us ask. Feel free to stay. But I really want to just thank you all for coming. It's been lively and engaged, and uh, lots of good things. I'm specializing in this panel for.